Okay. Hey, hi everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. It's entitled Anxiety, Friend or Foe. So I'm Taryn Hollander and I'm a doctoral intern at the Counseling Center. Um, and there's a, a good reason why I wanted to talk about anxiety today. So anxiety disorders are among the most common of all mental health concerns. In fact, research by the American College Health Association in 2018 found that 60% of students felt overwhelming anxiety during the past 12 months. And when I was thinking about that statistic, I was thinking 60%, that's a lot, um, but that's from 2018. So that was prior to the pandemic and also prior to some of the geopolitical concerns that we're dealing with now. And so I would venture a guess that more than 60% of college students um, or, or graduate students have um, felt overwhelming anxiety in the past year. So what we're gonna to do today is really talk about what anxiety is, we'll define it. We're gonna talk about how it can help us and the functions that it serves. Uh, we're also gonna talk about how it can hurt us. We're gonna differentiate between anxiety and fear and stress. Uh, those are terms that we often use like interchangeably when we're talking about anxiety, but so we'll try our best to sort of differentiate them. And then we're gonna talk about some practical ways that we can cope with anxiety and also panic. Um, and then I'll give you some resources. So uh, you can learn some more on your own if you want. Um, I should say that if you have any questions during um, the presentation, I think if you use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, then um, your questions will go to the moderator and then we'll be able to take them, okay? So what is anxiety? Anxiety is an emotion and it functions to help protect our physical, emotional, and social well-being. At the same time, anxiety can play a really powerful role in limiting us and increasing our suffering. So there are a lot of different ways that people define anxiety, um, but I decided to go with the American Psychological Association definition, which defines anxiety as an emotion characterized by feelings of tension, worried thoughts, and physical changes like increased blood pressure. So let's talk a little bit about how anxiety impacts us. So emotionally, when we experience anxiety, we begin to experience a sense of threat or danger. Um, many emotional reactions can be triggered and we almost always feel multiple emotions at once. So people characterize anxiety um, as feeling tense, overwhelmed, nervous, and restless. Um, and there, you might be able to think of some other emotion words that come to mind when you think about how you've experienced anxiety. So physically, anxiety impacts us um, by triggering our body's stress response, the fight, flight, or freeze response. And this survival system involves the release of powerful stress hormones that can allow us to run faster and longer, become motionless. Like I always think about if a bear attacks you, I'm pretty sure you're supposed to play dead. So that's what I think of when I think of the freeze. Um, and, or also fight harder so that you can stay alive in an emergency. So those are normal physical responses that our body has to anxiety to help keep us safe from a threat. So intellectually, when we experience anxiety, clear and rational thinking is likely to be impaired because our primitive mind is triggered. So you can think of your primitive mind as like a bodyguard that lives inside you that's just trying to keep you safe, right? So our bodyguard operates more automatically and fast, but it doesn't always operate based on all of the facts. So you can imagine like if your bodyguard thinks that you're in danger, they're gonna quickly react to keep you safe. They're not gonna sit there and be like, oh, hmm, well, what does this mean? And what does that mean? And what should we do next, right? So clear and rational thinking kind of goes offline and it's just reacting. So then anxiety also impacts our behaviors and our actions. So oftentimes when we experience anxiety, we try to get away from danger immediately, which makes sense. And we try to avoid it in the future. So sometimes this works, like if you're actually in danger and you avoid it, you're going to survive. So thank you, anxiety. But lots of times we can't avoid the triggers of anxiety and there's not actually danger. So we can call these like a false alarm. And avoidance of 
um, situations where you might feel your anxiety can lead to a loss of freedom and joy. So you can imagine if um, you're feeling anxious about going to a class because you might see someone there or you're, you know, have feel some type of way about, um, and so you don't go to class, then your anxiety is really dictating, like it, it's causing you to lose some freedom and ability to do the things that you want to do, right? So one thing that I hope that you're going to take away from this conversation today, and that I'm going to highlight here, and we'll come back to, is that safely approaching your anxiety, rather than avoiding it, or pretending it doesn't exist, is really a key to empowering yourself and regaining that freedom that you can sometimes lose when you're feeling anxious. Okay, so let's talk about the cool benefits of anxiety and how it can help us. So anxiety can help us direct our attention to things that need our attention. It can motivate us. This is the one that I think about the most probably. Like if you don't feel anxious about a test that you have or a paper that you need to write, you're never gonna work on it. There's no motivating factor, right? So our anxiety helps us kind of get off the couch and take care of some of the things we need to do. Um, it enhances our performance. So studies have shown that anxiety helps you perform better on tasks, uh, challenging tasks like tests. Uh, the problem is when uh, there's too much anxiety, then it can impair our ability to perform. But for sports too, um, anxiety can be helpful in helping you focus and attend to the challenge. So anxiety can help us achieve our goals. It gives us energy so that we can take action and it helps us keep um, ourselves safe and protect ourselves. Anxiety can also tell us about stuff that's going on uh, in, inside internally in our emotional world that maybe we're not necessarily in touch with. And so this, I like this little um, sticky note, but uh, graphic, but it shows us some of the things that anxiety can be telling us about our internal world. So anxiety can tell us that we're burning out and that we need to slow down. Anxiety can let us know that we're challenging our old patterns and that can feel scary. Sometimes when we feel anxious and we check in with why, we might realize that we're not fully trusting ourselves or listening to our intuition and that can make us feel kind of anxious. Anxiety can let you know that your body is recalling something and really needs our care. So I think sometimes when you feel anxious, um, you might wonder why and then think about something that happened in the past and then it might really be a signal that you need to process that or go back or take care of yourself around something that had happened in the past. Um, anxiety can show you that you want to feel more fulfilled and, and maybe something's missing. There's some anxiety around that, like what else do I need in my life or what's missing? And anxiety can also show you that a boundary that you set is maybe being challenged. I know for a lot of people, and me included, who experience anxiety, um, setting boundaries can be hard because uh, conflict or confrontation can feel hard because we get anxiety about having conflict or confrontation. And so when we do set a boundary and then someone challenges that, it can create a lot of anxiety around, oh, how am I going to cope with this? So those are just some of the things that anxiety um, might be telling you about what's happening for you internally. So anxiety also tells us something about ourselves that's really important. Um, recognizing the ways that anxiety is related to our strength and our values is really a powerful step toward changing our own relationship with anxiety. So what do I mean by that? Uh, what I mean is that if you're the type of person who feels anxious around social situations, um, what does that tell me about you? Well, that tells me that you're really interested in other people and you care about other people and you're thoughtful and maybe empathic about what their experience is like. And so in social situations, you feel nervous about making sure that you can get along with people. Or if you have anxiety around um, health anxiety, that tells me that you value your life and that you have goals that you want to accomplish, right? And so... Um, remembering or thinking about when we have anxiety about a certain situation, thinking about what does that mean about how much we care about that situation can be an interesting way of reframing our anxiety um, to help us learn something, you know, important about ourselves. 
So we are not our anxiety, just like we're not any other emotion that we experience. We're not our sadness. We're not our joy. Uh, we're not our boredom. We're not our anxiety either. But our struggles with anxiety do reflect amazing and beautiful things about our own strengths and values. So one thing that's cool about recognizing that, that anxiety tells us something interesting about ourselves um, is that reflecting on our values and then making actions that move us toward our values is really an effective way of coping um, with the symptoms of anxiety or managing those symptoms. Okay, so how can anxiety hurt us? I just think this is very cute. So I wanted to include it in here, but this is anxiety here. And then this is Sarah and you can, Sarah says, hello, anxiety, you and I aren't enemies. I know and accept that it is your job to keep me safe. And then anxiety's like, yes, I will keep you safe. And Sarah says, yep. And then anxiety says, I will keep you so safe. <laughs> She's like, wait, I think I love this comic because I think it really exemplifies and illustrates exactly what we're talking about which is like anxiety works for us, it's good for us, and it tells us cool things about ourselves until it's too much, right? And then it can cause some problems. Like this anxiety down here is a little jacked up. So let's talk about fear versus anxiety. So fear and anxiety are really similar, um, but anxiety is related to an expectation of a future threat. Uh, fear is really related to in, like your body's response to immediate danger. So how we can differentiate between fear and anxiety is that like if you see a bear charging towards you, you're going to feel intense fear or terror. Um, but if you are just worrying about what would happen if a bear attacked you during your hike, then we would characterize that as anxiety. So how is that different from a stress response or stress? So stress is really the mental and physical reaction to any kind of demand, threat, environmental challenge, or change in our environment. So stress can trigger many physical reactions and emotions, including anxiety. So stress is the thing that sort of triggers our anxiety or other emotional reactions. Our stress response, which we sort of touched on in the beginning, is our fight, flight, or freeze response. And it's the survival system we have um, and this system releases powerful stress hormones like adrenaline and cortisol, and that allows us to be more alert and enhances our ability to either run or freeze or fight for survival. So these hormones, when they surge, it's, that's what happens when we have a panic attack, right? So our body is responding to a perceived threat in the environment with this, this fight, flight, or freeze response ready to really take action when you're not actually in danger. It's like a false alarm, okay? And so it's adapted and it's important and it keeps us safe. But when we're not really in danger, it can be pretty uncomfortable to experience the fight, flight, or freeze response when there's nothing to actually fight with or flee from or freeze. Okay, so let's move into talking a little bit about what the fight, flight, or freeze response looks like, or what are some symptoms that we have when we experience panic attack. So a lot of people report, probably most often report, uh, faster, stronger heartbeat. And so that's adaptive because it brings more oxygen to your muscles so that you can run or fight. But like we said, if you have nothing to run from or fight against, then it can feel really uncomfortable when you're just sitting in class and your heart starts pounding. Uh, some people experience rapid breathing, which brings oxygen to your muscles, so it can help you run or um, fight if you need to. Some people describe feeling cold, tingling in your extremities, lightheadedness or numbness. And so th this is what happens when our blood moves away from our hands and our feet to um, our big muscles so that we can run. And it could also help in lessen, um, sorry, help lessen pain or bleeding um, if you are involved in a fight. So hyperventilation also creates lightheadedness and that feeling of, of tingling and that rapid breathing, that hyperventilation is helping you get oxygen to your muscles. So some people describe feeling hot or flushed um, and that's because blood is being pumped throughout your body. Also, another symptom is chest tightness or discomfort, which is really um, 
helping your body breathe, take deep breaths to get you uh, prepared for action. And then a lot of people, um, when they experience panic or fear, um, the fight or flight or freeze response, uh, experience stomach aches and nausea. And that's really because your body is not worried about digesting your lunch when your body wants to fight. So the blood will move away from your digestive system, creating that feeling of nausea. So other people experience shaking or trembling, which is your muscles tensing and being active, ready to be used. Some people experience muscle, muscle tension, like oh, just feeling like really on edge and like your muscles are clenching and that's your body preparing to use those muscles. Um, people, when they have high anxiety or panic, can have trouble sleeping, and that's because your mind is really like hyper aroused. It's on high alert to keep you safe because it perceives that there might be something threatening happening in your environment. Uh, there's this feeling that you like have to do something, like you're compelled to like do something, and that's your body really uh, ready to act to protect you from danger. Some people experience visual changes, right, which it helps you see threats. And then there's this feeling of not really being in reality, which is called derealization. It feels like you're kind of watching things unfold, like things don't actually feel like you're engaged at, um, in, in your environment. And then there's also something called depersonalization where you feel kind of like separate from your body or like outside your body. And these two symptoms, they're probably not as common when we experience panic attacks, but um, but a lot of people do, um, they reduce emotional intensity and overwhelm during the periods of panic, kind of removes you a little bit from that. And it can also be related to trauma. And then the last thing that people talk about, I mean, I, wish, I shouldn't say the last thing because there are other symptoms that people have that are not, this list is not exhaustive, but um, some people experience sweating when they have a panic attack and that prevents you from overheating, but it also makes your body slippery, you know, so that bear can't grab you. So now that we have talked to kind of about the good things about anxiety, problems with anxiety, and also panic, let's talk about like some really concrete ways that we can cope with anxiety and panic. Um, and so we're going to talk about this worksheet called Understanding My Signs of Anxiety. And then also we're gonna talk about increasing our acceptance of worry and the associated symptoms, and also paying attention to our worry and our other feelings and, and what that means, okay? So here's the first tool. Um, I don't know if anyone's taking notes, but if you are, this um, this is like an activity that you can do on your own. So you might wanna take notes. Uh, if you don't wanna take notes, you can email me uh, and I can send you this worksheet. So that would be fine. Um, I'll give you my email at the end. So this worksheet, My Signs of Anxiety, just has like five different domains where it asks you to think about and then maybe write down things that you notice when you're experiencing anxiety, elevated anxiety, or even panic. So the first thing is like, what are the physical changes you notice? Are you noticing muscle tension, rapid heartbeat, rapid breathing, shakiness, dizziness, lightheadedness, chest pressure, feeling on edge? How does anxiety feel for you? Because it is probably different for all of us, although there is some commonality in the symptoms that we experience. So beginning to notice what are your physical changes that you experience when you have anxiety is going to help you start to notice when you're experiencing anxiety so that you can cope with it, okay? It's just like about getting more in touch with um, what's happening for your body. So we also want to pay attention to how our behaviors change and what are the actions uh, that we take when we feel anxious. So people report things like avoiding their friends, avoiding school, avoiding work, withdrawing, uh, changes in your relationship with your partner, maybe feeling more irritable, um, fidgeting. Some people experience increased like picking at their skin or their hair or their body, um, using substances to avoid the feelings of anxiety or maybe like avoiding hanging out with friends, turning down invitations or noticing changes in your eating habits or your body posture and also changes in um, TV and gaming habits. I'll just share with you, I know I'm feeling anxious when I start um, playing Candy Crush, which would be a change in my gaming habits. Um, so I think that's, that's a clue that I have. So you might want to think about what are the things that you do um, or that you notice that change in your behavior when you're starting to feel anxiety. 
And so you also want to pay attention to what are the thoughts that you have when you experience anxiety. Um, I think a lot of us engage in kind of negative self-talk when we're experiencing anxiety, saying things to yourself like, I'm going to fail, I'm losing it, people probably think I'm, you know, X, Y, and Z, like crazy, or I can't cope, um, I feel like I can't breathe. So noticing not only how your body's changing and your behaviors are changing, but how the way you think can change when you have anxiety. And then also thinking about how it affects your emotions. So noticing the, how you start feeling overwhelmed, frustration, sad, feelings of annoyance, um, feeling panicky or frantic, but like all over the place. I hear that one a lot. Um, or feeling scared. And another one I hear a lot is numb, just kind of like checked out um, or doomed, or restless, all these different feelings that you can associate with um, that emotion of anxiety. And then lastly, paying attention to like, what are any additional signs that you have uh, that let you know that you're feeling anxious? What are the signs that your friends and your family might say about you? Like, oh, I know Taryn's anxious when she like, I don't know, starts like rubbing my fingers on the table or something. So no noticing your own signs of anxiety, is going to help you notice when your anxiety is rising. And then when you should implement some of those coping skills that can help you bring it back down, okay? And also this, this practice of just noting or noticing what's happening for your experience, um, just kind of naming it. There's this thing that we always say in, in therapy, which is like name it to tame it. Just the practice of noting it and paying attention to it is going to help it diminish a little bit. So here's another specific tool that I really like called worry time. Worry time is really just setting a timer and giving yourself permission each day to feel all of those feelings of worry. I know early on in the, um, I think on the first slide, we talked about how sometimes um, feelings of anxiety can lead to avoidance because we don't it's not that comfortable to have those physical effects of anxiety and we don't want to feel that way. So we'll try to push it off or avoid it. Um, the thing is when we do that, it just builds up. Like if you can imagine, sometimes I think about a beach ball, if you're like trying to hold it under the water, it, it can be hard. And then when you let go, it like pops up and bursts in your face. And then you're like, ah, and then you have a panic attack. So rather than trying to just shove it away or push it down, making time for it every day that's really structured can help you feel some of those feelings so that they can be processed and dissipate. Um, and it can also give you more control. So, you know, if you're feeling anxious and you're supposed to be focusing on something else or you're trying to complete a task for an assignment for a class or something, um, you can remind yourself like, hey, I have worry time tonight, so I'll worry about that later. And it can help you sort of just shift your focus back to what you need, because you know, when you later, when you have time, you will be able to get in touch with some of those worry feelings. Um, making time for your worry can help it dissipate. And then you also learn that like, you can tolerate worry. It doesn't always feel comfortable. It can feel, um, intense sometimes as well. Uh, but as you learn how to sit with it over time in a structured way, uh, you realize that it's not so bad and, and you're sort of approaching your anxiety or accepting your anxiety in a way that it helps lessen its impact on you. It seems counterintuitive, but it works. So this next um, coping skill is my favorite and it's called AWARE. And it's really just this acronym AWARE, right? And every letter stands for a step. This is super helpful for when you're experiencing a panic attack. Um, as we said earlier in the presentation, when you're experiencing a panic attack, um, your body's having a physical response to a threat. And so once your body thinks that there's a threat in the environment and you're in danger, it's like, it's gonna have that physical response that ship has sailed. You cannot like reel it in or like talk your body out of it. Like, oh, hey, I'm not actually in danger. Like stop having that response. No, it's too late. It's already happening. So once you realize that you're having a panic attack, the first step is really to just acknowledge like, oh, that's what's happening here. I'm having a panic attack and accept it. Okay, I've, this has happened before. It's happening now and I'm just gonna accept it. Um, can't fight it. I can't stop it. 
It's a normal part of being a human. It's an adaptive physiological response to danger. I'm not actually in danger, but my body's going to do this thing. And so I'm going to just let it happen. Importantly, in that, that step of acknowledge and accept, there's no judgment. There's no like, why is this happening to me? Why can't I manage my emotions? All those kind of negative thoughts just kind of exacerbate the problem. It's a normal, natural thing to have, to have anxiety. And so we're just gonna accept it. The next step is to wait and watch, right? And then that's when you're gonna note your symptoms. So what's happening in my body? Um, I'm, my heart is pounding, okay? I'm having that sense of like feeling separate from my body. I feel weird. I'm hyperventilating, and you're just going to note your symptoms, again, non-judgmentally, um, and just kind of list them and pay attention. The next A stands for action, and that's not action to stop a panic attack. Once, like I always said, once your body's going down that path, it's going to go down that path. Um, you can't really stop all those hormones from being released. They've already been released. And so the action is really to make yourself more comfortable as you ride out the panic attack. So that could look like, you know, laying down if you're at home or um, splashing water on your face to help you feel more in your body, taking deep breaths into your belly um, as a way of slowing your heart rate. So just um, taking action to make yourself feel more comfortable as you when we get to the R is repeat, as you acknowledge and accept you're having an anxiety attack or a panic attack, you notice what your symptoms are, make yourself as comfortable as you can, and then you just keep going through those steps until it ends. And the end step isn't anything that you necessarily have to do. It's just to remind you that it, they do end. Panic attacks typically last around 15 minutes and they're 15 terrible minutes of discomfort and it can feel really uncomfortable um but you can survive it and it will end right it's not your body cannot sustain that level of distress for very long like once your body's like oh there's no bear for us to fight you're going to come back down okay and so what happens as you start to use these steps as you experience your anxiety and you experience panic is that you realize you can cope with it and then it becomes less scary. And if it's less scary, you're less worried about it. And if you're less worried about it, your anxiety goes down and then you have less panic attacks, okay? So it seems counterintuitive, but kind of accepting your anxiety is what's gonna help it diminish. So here's another tool. Um, I just put the kind of goes wave here because it's, it's a cool picture, but it's to remind us to surf that wave. Um, it's really helpful for me to think about anxiety as a wave, right? There's that initial buildup where you feel like the uh, water sucking back and you're like, oh no, I'm starting to feel bad. And then there's, it crashes over you. You, you feel like you know, ah, I'm drowning. This is very uncomfortable. I don't like this. Um, you're getting tumbled around in the waves a little bit. And then the wave recedes, right? And you go back to being like ah, fine and calm in the water. And so thinking about instead of getting tumbled around in the wave, just sort of riding that wave, like imagining yourself with a surfboard and riding your anxiety, knowing that it can be uncomfortable and scary as you're on the top of that wave, but knowing also that it's going to uh, retreat. And I like this wave metaphor, not only for anxiety, but for all of our emotions, right? Noticing that they have um, a buildup and a peak, at which can feel intense sometimes or uncomfortable, and then and then it diminishes. Even the positive emotions, you know, follow that sort of wave pattern too. Um, and so, just being aware of that can help you sort of uh, more comfortably ride it out. If that makes sense. So, another specific tool is is mindfulness, and we could do like a whole course or series on mindfulness and mindfulness techniques. And so we're not going to do that. We don't have the time for that now. I do want to say that we have every semester, um, I think twice per semester here at the Counseling Center, we do have a mindfulness group, uh, group therapy, which uh, is really helpful in helping you um, learn the skills to do mindfulness on your own at home. So if that's something that any of you are interested in, that's something I would definitely recommend signing up for. Uh, we also have the therapy assistance online. Which you can just go there at the Counseling Center website and go right to that link. And um, you just log in with your credentials from Texas State. And then um, 
there's like modules on mindfulness and stuff that you can work on on your own. But mindfulness meditation has been defined as paying attention in a particular way. So it's paying attention on purpose in the present moment and non-judgmentally. And being that that my anxiety worksheet was really about paying attention, right, to what's happening in your body, what's happening in your mind, what's happening emotionally, and what's happening with your actions related to your anxiety, and just sort of noting it. And as we get better and better at attending to the present moment and noting it non-judgmentally, um, that can reduce our anxiety. And so this one author, Dan Harris, who wrote the book 10% Happier, described mindfulness as the skill of knowing what's happening in your head without getting carried away with it. So it's almost like you're observing what's happening for you when you're experiencing anxiety, um, rather than being so intensely feeling the anxiety, right? It's like a step back a little bit. So mindfulness practice um, can help you do that. And there's plenty, plenty, plenty of research showing us that mindfulness practice decreases anxiety. It decreases the reoccurrence of depression. It lowers your risk of heart disease. It lowers your stress levels. Um, it helps with substance use, chronic pain, insomnia, and everything. So if mindfulness practice is something you can start working in to your uh, week or your day even, that's something that's going to have some benefits for, you, for your mental health and specifically anxiety. And mindfulness practice has also been shown to increase the quality of life, increase immune system functioning, um, attentional control, and also satisfaction in our relationships. So that's my little plug for mindfulness in this presentation. And I just want to remind you, too, that um, breathing is a way that we can like mindfully just be in our bodies and attend to what's happening. Um, diaphragmatic breathing or deep belly breathing has been shown to slow your heart rate, so that can help when you're experiencing anxiety. And then there's also this um, progressive muscle relaxation. It's a technique um, that's a little bit more active rather than you know, some. Sometimes people feel with mindful meditation that they're not doing anything and, and want to do something that's a little bit more active. So progressive muscle relaxation is a way that you can. Um, be mindful and also be doing something, you know, so it's, a, it's an exercise that walks you through um, a series of, you know, tensing and releasing muscles. And so if you just YouTube progressive muscle relaxation, put it in the search bar, the guided meditations will come up that you can do on your own. So now we're done talking about anxiety. And so I guess I just want to take a moment for everyone to think to yourself, like after talking about anxiety here, what do you think? Like is anxiety your friend or your foe? A little bit of both. I think um, as I've been thinking about it, yeah, it feels pretty complex. And I appreciate my anxiety for helping keep me safe and helping motivate me. Um, and also, I don't like it when it tips over into um, a physical response where I'm feeling really uncomfortable. And so it can be both of those things, I think. Um, but it, I think it's interesting to think about for yourself, too. So some resources for you. There's the Counseling Center website. Um, which is listed there under the second website, but also you can come to the Counseling Center for individual or group therapy. A lot of clients come to talk about anxiety, how to cope, um, and it's, as, as we said right at the beginning of the presentation, it's a really common issue that students are facing, and so um, group therapy and individual therapy can be really helpful. Um, I also give you the link to the website for the Anxiety and Depression Association of America. They have a tips page and they have a lot of information about um, some of what we've talked about here, like what's happening for your body when you have anxiety, the different coping skills other than the ones I shared with you today. And then I put some YouTube search terms there that I think are helpful and I like YouTube because it's free. You know, there's like, there are other resources like calm.com or Headspace, but those you have to pay for. So um, you can just use YouTube and just knowing that like grain of salt, sometimes weird stuff comes up when you search these things. So you might have to try a couple of videos, but you can search for mindfulness, meditation, um, you know, 
guided meditation about anxiety, anxiety meditation, belly breathing, progressive muscle relaxation, grounding techniques are another one we just very briefly touched on, but those are some other things that you can look for um, to help you with coping with anxiety. And then um, there's also the therapy assistance online, which you all have access to and is free and has a lot of uh, good information about how to cope with anxiety and panic and also mindfulness. And that's right on the Counseling Center website. Um, and my, um, you can always contact the Counseling Center too if you want an access to that, um, uh, that My Anxiety Worksheet that I shared. So, um, and then, so I just want to thank you all for coming and for your attention. And then also um, shout out to Dr. David Emmert, who um, created this program called Calming Anxiety, Living Mindfully Calm, which um, is where I pulled a lot of the resources for this presentation today. And so he's out of San Jose State um, in California. So if there's any questions, you can send them to the Q&A. Um, but yeah, thank you. Oh, can you get my email from notes? Yeah, my email is, um, I don't know if we're supposed to do this or not. Medea, do you know if we're supposed to do this or not? Okay. If you feel comfortable sharing your email, you can type it in the chat, yeah. Oh, no, sorry, I meant the presentation feedback survey. Do you know if we're supposed to do that? But I will, I will put my email in the chat. But yeah, as far as the presentation survey, that's that's good too. Okay, yeah. So if you don't mind, if you all can do this QR thing, or you can go to this website and just put in. Um, this was like a photo, so I couldn't edit it, but just put in today's date, which is the twenty eighth of March, and then this is anxiety friend or foe, and then I'm the presenter. It's my name's Taryn. There's only one Taryn at the counseling center, so you'll know. Um, so did any uh, questions come up in the Q&A or I guess not? Okay, well, my email's there. So um, thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. And um, you can reach out to the Counseling Center if you have any questions, okay?